Chapter Ten. What's this? What's this about you visiting Ray in the hospital? Yasmin sat on the only armchair in the room, watching Summer ironing. How did you know? Who doesn't know? He's been telling everyone. He was back at work now, but only coming in for the lectures. Then I go home and collapse into bed. He had told Summer. She said to Yasmin, "Did he tell you himself? What did he say?" He said you were very courageous. Me courageous. She smiled and sprayed water on the skirt. The ir- she was ironing. Courageous. Yesterday, while with him, the department secretaries have surrounded her, gushed, "How sweet of you, Summer, to go and visit him," and she, overwhelmed, had stepped back closer to him, away from their smell of talcum powder and gold blend. He looked pleased with himself. When they turned away, he whispered to Summer, "Coup d'état." So speak. What is going on? Yasmin said. You know that, Masha Allah, you look bigger than five months. Are you sure you count it right? Yasmin, sitting, looked like something large and round had fallen from the sky onto her lap. She ignored her and went on. You are the last person in the world I expected this from. Who do you imagine you? What do you imagine you're doing? Nothing. Are you going to marry someone who's not a Muslim? Of course not. That would be against the Sharia. So what's the point then of running off to see him in the hospital? Summer managed a smile at the running off to see him. I'm being optimistic. Did he tell you he's going to convert? No, she said lightly. He had not even told her that he wanted to marry her. I think he could. Why not? Why not? Because someone like him is probably an agnostic, if not an atheist. The whole of the department are atheists. These people are so left-wing. Religion is the opium of the people, and all that. Summer did not know what agnostic meant. She concentrated on the pleats of the skirt, maneuvering the iron. She wished Yasmin would talk about something else, and he was to blame for this. She couldn't understand why he was telling everyone that she had been to see him at the hospital. At times he seemed so reserved to her and secretive. At other times, open like this. Now she would have, to, now she would have liked to ask Yasmin about his ex-wife. What color were her eyes? Instead, Yasmin was intent on giving her a lecture of some sort. I have seen the kind of Scottish men who marry Muslim girls. Yasmin went on. The typical scenario: he's with an oil company sent to Malaysia or Singapore. She's this cute little thing in a mini skirt who's out with him every night. Come marriage time, it's by the way I'm a Muslim and my parents will not let you marry me until you convert. And how do I convert, my darling? I love you. I can't live without you. Oh, it's just a few words you have to say. Just say the shahada. It's just a few words. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. End of story. They get married, and she might, as the years go by, pray and fast, or she might not. But it has nothing to do with him. Everything in his life is just the same as it was before. Summer shrugged. It's not the same situation. Is he going to say the shahada without meaning it, just to marry you? I don't know. Yes, mean didn't say anything in response. She moved her chair to face the bed and put her feet up. Her stockings were a color Summer would not wear. Summer thought that if she had offered to do raised laundry for him, his socks would be dry now on the radiators. What would Yasmin have said about that? You're leaving in a few weeks' time," said Yasmin. "If I were you, I'd avoid him like the plague till then. Go home, and maybe you'll meet someone normal, someone Sudanese like yourself." Mixed couples just don't look right; they irritate everyone. But he's very nice, don't you think he's nice? All that coughing and spluttering gets on my nerves. Summer laughed. "You're horrible," she said. "I'm worried. That's all," said Yasmin. 
Have you talked to him about becoming a Muslim? Not really, no. But he always says good things about Islam, things I didn't even know. He understands. That's his work, the field in which he's very highly thought of. But his interest, as far as I know, is just an academic interest. But it could become more than that. Do you, do you know if he even believes in God? Of course he believes in God. He's not empty inside. Atheists can be as nice as anyone else. Being good or kind has nothing to do with it. Also, he told me that he believes that the Quran is a sacred text. That's the way they do research nowadays. It's a modern thing. Something to do with not being Eurocentric. They take what each culture says about itself. So they could study all sorts of sacred texts and be detached. They could have their own religious views or be atheists. You think Ray is an atheist? I wouldn't be surprised. I would not be surprised at all. Summer put the iron down. Never in her life had anyone she cared about been an unbeliever. Not religious, yes. Not praying. Not particularly caring about what's right or wrong. But always the faith was there. Always Allah was there. His existence never denied. It was unbearable to think that Ray was so unaware. She left the ironing, hurried and put her coat on, covered her hair with a scarf, rummaged for chain from her purse. Where are you going? His number. Where did she have his number? Drawer opened, papers thrown out. She had never telephoned him at home before. What's wrong with you? Where are you going? She found the number, ignored Yasmin. She ran down the stairs to the landing. One of the tenants was getting his bicycle from under the stairs. Leather jacket, long hair tied up with an elastic band, the source of the loud music that came through the ceiling. She was frightened of that man and usually listened and checked that he was not coming up or down the stairs before she left her flat. Now when she saw him, she dropped one of her coins on the ground and had to bend down to pick it up. When she stood up, he was sneering at her. Then he jerked his bicycle from under the stairs and rattled away. There were chains around his trousers, the sharp step of his boots. When he opened the front door, a gust of cold wind blew in. She shivered. The telephone, dialing, her fingers awkward, clumsy, ringing. It rang and rang. She let it ring. It rang and rang. She shivered and the telephone rang, each unanswered ring cutting through an emptiness, a windy place. At last, a sleepy voice, recognition. Ray, do you believe in God? In his silence, she banged her head against the wall, gently, rhythmically. The wall felt cool against her forehead pleasantly solid. The receiver in her hand kept slipping. She thought, I love his voice. He must have been deeply asleep. He's still not well. His voice and how, he, how heavy he is inside, heavy enough for me to sink in. All this will, will be forbidden to me? Where will I? She closed her eyes, banged her forehead against the wall. Mid-January and the afternoon light seeped into the hall, the day beginning to get longer, a subtle change in the sun's light. When he spoke, it was as if she had expected the silence to last forever. His clear voice startled her. Yes, he said, I do. You're not a, an atheist? She struggled with the word so seldom used. She mispronounced it. No, I'm not. There was a smile in his voice. She sat down on the stairs. I thought you knew, he said. I wasn't sure. I should have been more clear. The landing, the bicycles under the stairs, Yasmin upstairs were superseded. I woke you up, she said. You were fast asleep. I dreamt of you. Tell me. He said, I was in a big house with many rooms. 
It was almost like a mansion. I was hiding because outside the house I had been followed, chased for days. I carried a sword in my hand and there was blood on it, my enemy's blood. But I myself, my clothes and my hands were clean and I was proud of that. He paused and then went on. I went in a room full of smoke, a lot of smoke, but when I checked there was no fire. When I left the room, the handle of my sword broke. I held it broken in my hands and knew that it could never be mended. It could never be reliable again. This was a terrible loss. I don't know why, but I had this feeling of deep loss because I had to go on without the sword. I walked to the other rooms of the house, searching. There were many rooms halls, passageways. I found a staircase and I began to climb. At the top of the stairs, there was a room, and you were there. What was I doing? Cooking? She smiled. Cooking what? Vegetables, I think. She saw green peppers and aubergines. She spoke each word slowly. And was I happy to see you? You were, very much, and then you gave me a glass of milk to drink. Milk? How childish of me. I'm so sorry. He laughed and said, I drank it. I drank it all. I didn't mind. Chapter 11 She made soup for him. She cut up corrugates, celery, and onions. Her feelings were in the soup, the froth that rose to the surface of the water when she boiled the chicken, the softened, the shapeless tomatoes, pasta shaped into the smallest stars, a spice that she had to search for, the name unknown in English, not in any of the Arabic-English dictionaries that she had. Habban. Habban. She must walk around the supermarket, frantically searching for something she could not ask about, and she was a translator. She should know. Haban. Without it, the soup would not taste right, would not complete, would not be complete. At last, she found the Haban. It existed. It had a name. Whole green cardamom. Cardamom pods. They must be split open, the seeds inside crushed into powder. It seemed unfair to her that he was all alone, ill alone, and, she, and he dragged himself to teach every day and came back home, to an unmade bed, unwashed cups and dishes, meals that he had, he had to cook himself. In the department, they said that he was turning into a workaholic. She said to him, They told you that at the hospital to take time off work. Why don't you listen? He said that there were too many things that needed to be done. She put the soup into two plastic containers, carried them to work. She was waiting for him when he came out of the lecture theater, coughing, his fingers covered in chalk. She saw the change in him, the way he turned his back on everything else, his students who were coming out, the next class that was going in. When he spoke to her, it was as if there was no one around, no physical world, his voice different. She had come to realize that when he talked to others, kind, less sharp. It took him a few minutes to understand what she was saying, what she was carrying, what she was giving him. Then he said, Oh, Summer, in a low voice, too much emotions. So that they were both, after that, unable to say ordinary things, the usual things. Thank you very much. I hope you like it. I will like it for sure. You can freeze it. She turned and made her way down corridors illuminated with fluorescent lights, crowded with students taller than her, their loose denims, rucksacks, soft hair that fell over young eyes. Two weeks, two weeks and she would be far away on another continent, sunshine. No need to put things on lights, no need to put on the lights indoors. In two weeks' time, she would leave this city. She had booked her plane tickets from London. She must book her train ticket from Aberdeen. She had bought the things her aunt had asked for. 
she must start packing. She thought of going home, seeing home again, its colors again, and in spite of the years of yearning, all she had now was reluctance and some fear.